We are. All righty. Um, this is Mary Lou, and I'm sitting here with Christian, the coordinator for the Master Gardeners program here in Allegheny County. And I actually have a few live bodies out here in the audience, at least for a short while, then they have to go. So our topic here, the very beginning of a cold, very cold, somewhat snowy February morning is about ferns of the Northeast. Because I think one of the things that we in the North miss is all that green. I remember my grandson who lives in the Southwest came to visit in the summertime. And his comment was, gee, grandma, it sure is green around here because he kind of lives in the desert where you don't really have a lot of green. So we're going to talk about ferns and I have some lovely pictures, so don't go away, but you're going to have to wait just a little while because as always, those of you that know me, I have to do a slight introduction before we start looking at the beautiful ferns. And um, it kind of, well, it didn't really surprise me. I knew that ferns were very, very ancient, but I didn't quite realize how ancient until I started doing some research. And we have to go back at least 350 million years ago uh, to round things off. Before that, all land was in the sea. And then first with the lichens creeping up on the rocks, and then the mosses, and then the ferns came about 350 million years ago and began to colonize plant life on the earth, not in the sea. And flowers, which we, you know, when we think of gardening, we think of flowers, but they didn't show up until about 145 million years ago. So that gave the ferns 200 million years head start, which is really a long time. Even for someone like me that studies geology, 200 million years is a long time. Um, and so when I walk out into my woodland garden, the ferns that grow there naturally in my deciduous woods or the ones I've planted, it's like walking back into Paleolithic times, the old Stone Age, even before the dinosaurs. And then, of course, thinking of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago, we all now know, the big rock came and hit into the waters off of the Yucatan Peninsula and extinguished within a very short time, a few months, much of life on the Earth. About 90% of species disappeared within a very short time, including our dinosaurs. But the ferns survived. And in the aftermath, all that desolation, they once again took over the world for quite a few million years. And as time went on, more recently, with the glaciers, we in North America are very lucky compared to Europe. I just gave Dave, sitting over there, one of my old wonderful map books, and you might find it in there somewhere. In Europe, the mountain ranges tend to run east to west. Think of the Alps, the Pyrenees. In North America, the Appalachians, the Rockies, although they weren't around that long ago, run north and south. So when the age of the glaciers started, a couple of I'm forgetting now, millions of years ago, and move south, plants and animals had time to retreat in front of them and therefore survive. And when the glaciers melted back about 10,000 years ago, the plants and the animals could repopulate the land. So we didn't lose, like Europe did, a lot of our species, and that included the ferns. A more recent example, which I hadn't thought about until I was just reading this wonderful fern book. I should have brought it, forgot, with me. Um, when Mount St. Helens blew, do you remember that, guys? Oh, yeah. 1980? The desolation for many, many miles around, one of the first things that came back to clothe the land in the green were the ferns. So ferns know how to survive and to live on. And there's... A lot of people, why do you want to grow moss? 
Why do you want to you try and get rid of moss? Why do you grow ferns? They have no flowers. For me, I think, I, I believe in Jung, that psychologist who said, we have a primal memory that we're born with. It's somehow in our genes that remembers non-verbally ancient, ancient parts of ourselves. And we evolved in the forests, well, our ancestors, the lemurs before primates, in the forests of East Africa. And we lived in a world of green. And somehow that is part of our encoded DNA, that fondness for the green. And so, and, and the fact that something has, in spite of the ups and downs of climate and glaciers and catastrophes, the ferns managed to survive. And I think we admire that. So why don't we love, why, why wouldn't we love the ferns? All righty. Um, why don't we um, skip to the first picture? Whoops. Whoops. Our computer is not behaving itself. There we go. Okay. Yeah. This, now I, I'm sorry, I don't have the date of this. Somehow I copied this picture from a magazine from, I picked up an old magazine on the kitty stand in Alfred. I call it the kitty stand. And people throw away their old magazines. Sometimes they're 20, 30, 40 years old. And you can get these wonderful images. And so this came from somewhere. It's a rock that split, probably shale, I'm thinking, because shale splits beautifully. And here we have impressed in the rock the ancient remains, the fossil of this fern, whose name I do not know. And I don't know how old this is either but it's an example of a fossilized fern that's been around for probably millions of years. Okay, now this folks I'm admitting is a totally new program that uh, Rima at the library helped me put together. I had an original fern program from maybe 10 years ago, mostly from my garden, but I wanted to add some things. So Rima at the library helped me put these in. This is the first time, and Christian just ran it off on a piece of colored paper. I'm, I'm of the old fashioned kind. Give me a piece of paper. Um, so I'm looking at this <laughs> new program for the first time. So Christian, what's our first image, which I believe is something I added. Uh, oh, one. good. I can read fern it. Parts. Fern parts. Um, this is from a book I had on ferns where somebody who can draw did these beautiful pen and ink drawings, which I think are better than actual photographs of the real thing because everything is so clearly done. And so once again, we can see the various parts of the fern, which we're not going to dwell on. <laughs> so, so let's move on. And here, once again, the fronds basically fall into different categories, just like the leaves on a tree. Um, there are certain categories. And so this will help you in identifying what kind of uh, fern you have out there in the forest. All righty. Next one. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. All righty. This is one of my favorites. It's an evergreen. Common around, well, it's around. I don't know how common it is. Called the Christmas fern. And the reason it's called that is if you look carefully at the frond, and once again, I'm terrible on vocabulary. I apologize, guys. If you pluck off one of the little green parts of the frond, it looks like a Christmas, it looks like a stocking that we used to in the old days hang on the mantle at Christmas time, where, and it's got its nickname, the Christmas fern. And since Terry, a master gardener that used to help me put these programs together, she actually studied Latin in high school. Hmm. Uh, I didn't. And she would always insist on putting the Latin name down. The reason being, we might call it a Christmas fern. Who knows what they call it? Do these grow down in Colombia? Yeah. Yes. What do you yeah. call them down there? Nickname. El lecho. Which means? Um, like a place to, like a bed. A bed. Or, like some, yeah. Okay. Like, so, kinda. all right. So if you and I are talking about this fern and you're calling it that, and I'm calling it this, we have no idea that it's the same fern, but because the rules from about 200 years ago, Linnaeus, I think, 
gave everything a Latin name, two parts. Then we all, if we're educated, <laughs> know what we're talking about. Now, I think I have another picture of this Christmas fern, do I? What's the next picture? Well, no, it's the, not. I was just checking here the, okay. the Christmas fern. And yeah, all right. The Latin name is just hard to pronounce it. I know it's hard it's, to pronounce it. Polystichum. Polis, polysticum, <laughs> polysticum acrosticoides. All right, which is why I don't do the Latin. All righty. <laughs> polysticum acrosticoides. Now, this is an evergreen plant <laughs> that grows as a clump, which means if you're planting it in a garden and you're like me, you like everything to stay where you put it and not crowd out its neighbors. Hang on a sec. Um, okay, that's a that's a, a drawing of it. Um, it's a well-behaved fern, but it grows, like many ferns, very, very slowly. I think in a minute we're going to see a bigger clump, but it's only 30 years old. All right, let's move to the other picture of it, I think. It's All right. One. Yeah. This one I probably transplanted 30 years ago from a little you know, four inch, maybe four fronds from my woods and planted it on the north side of my house in amended soil. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and you can see it really takes a long time to, to grow. So you have to have patience. Or if you're buying these from the nursery, plan to spend a fortune if you want a big one. <laughs> and I mean a fortune. If you buy one for 10, 15, 20 dollars, you're only going to get a tiny little thing that's going to take a long time to grow. So um, before we move on, we can just look at this pretty um, Christmas fern here on the north side of my house. If you decide you want to grow a fern garden, here's the basics in general for most ferns that you need. Um, they like some sort of shade. Now that can mean the north side of your house, which means um, May through August, it might have an hour early in the morning of sunlight and later in the day, but most of the day it's going to be in the shadow of your house. Or dapple shade in a wood lot or a forest where the leaves fill out by May and then you get just a dappling of shade. Um, maybe the east side of your house, a.m., early morning sun. Although with our increasing temperatures, it's probably not a good idea anymore. So north side in the woods in dapple shade, or possibly if you have a great big tree, you might wanna plant it under that, you know, like a lawn specimen tree that's out there in the middle of your lawn but it's 20, 30 feet in diameter, so it is shady most of the time underneath. That Deciduous would work. or evergreen? Pardon? Deciduous or an evergreen tree? Um, I would steer clear of the evergreen trees, which by the way, because they produce such heavy shade and they suck up all the moisture, the, the conditions are dry shade and very few things are happy in a dry shade. Yeah, I don't think I've seen a plant under a No, evergreen. I would forget that. Just let the pine needles mulch underneath your evergreen trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some wildflowers when we do another talk on that, mm -hmm. that could do that, but not ferns. They like a nice humusy soil, lots of compost, dead leaves. Um, let's leave it at that. Like what accumulates on the floor of a forest after 100, 200, 300 years. So when I planted, let me think, so they like shade, they like moisture, they like humus. They don't like a lot of wind, which usually be in the woods, you don't get a lot of wind. So when I planted my woodland gardens, which included ferns, you can't compete in a woods with the roots that are always already there and they're everywhere. So I made some beds and I brought in a mixture of about half good topsoil and the other half was a mix of sand and peat moss. If you don't want to buy peat moss because you feel like you're stealing it from the wilds of the world, <laughs> then um, gather up leaves in the fall and mow them up, let them rot down a year, and you have leaf mold. So some kind of humusy and some sand 
and some good topsoil. And all I did was bring in six inches because that's enough to get wildflowers and ferns started. And it takes about four or five or six years before the roots decide <laughs> to grow up into this. But then, then they are established and they will almost always survive. So let me think. Um, the other thing is they, they prefer, most of them prefer a slightly acid soil, which we usually have no problem with. Somewhere in the pH six range. So usually you don't have to do anything about that. Let me look at my notes. So some kind of a shade, no wind, moist, but not usually soggy, soggy soil, humusy, and a slightly acidic. So if you provide those conditions, most of the ferns that I suggest you grow will do just fine. Okay, um, what's our next picture then? That rock there. Ah, okay. This, hmm. Now this is one of the ones that isn't normal for around here because most rock ferns, polypodies, I think is their Latin polypody, are, we're kind of getting up towards the northern end of their limit, with, even with our zone five now. Um, they do like to grow on rocks or around a rock pile. They don't grow, they're also evergreen, and I, I actually put a fence over them so the deer don't eat them. They don't seem to eat the Christmas ferns, but they did one year eat my rock fern. It's not very tall, six, eight inches tall, and once again, it spreads very slowly. But it's a, you know, I think the evergreen ferns have a special, um, I have a special love for them. <coughs> okay, what, what's next? Deer. The, okay, deer fern's the only one that, in a sense, I don't believe is indigenous to the northeastern woods. They come more from the west coast. But I did succumb, and I bought one or two. And once again, they tend to be evergreen, but they're more spiky. And what's interesting, because of the competition with my roots on my trees, mine have never grown more than eight or nine or maybe ten inches high. My daughter in San Diego, in their garden in the city, the deer fern grow two, three feet tall. Oh. A longer season, and they water their lawn, um, and it just is happier out on the West Coast, where I believe it comes from originally. So, all righty, what's next? We just keep chugging along here. Oh, for some reason, all the ones that are more difficult and less common wound up at the beginning of the talk. Um, what do you see here, guys? What is this planted in out in the woods? Can you see it? What is, what is that that it's planted in? When I bought my land 40 years ago, 15 years before when the Cornell boys were 15 and in Future Farmers, um, they, had built, they had started to build a cabin in what became my woods. Um, they never got the cabin built, but they had laid a foundation of cinder blocks, which of course, after 25 years or so, 30 years maybe, it had become encrusted with the moss. I read somewhere that cinder blocks, whether it's the foundation of your house, will leach out the lime and create the soil around it much more, um, a higher pH towards neutral. Ah, which means you don't plant your azaleas right against your foundation because yeah. you're going to have to amend the soil more. So I thought, okay, spleenwort, which only grows about eight inches tall, beautiful black, uh, we don't call it a stem, I think it's called a stripe, and then it's green um, fronds, shiny. I really wanted some of them, and I actually bought five from a nursery. The, this one, these two did not survive, planted in the holes of the cinder block, two, three years and they died out. I have one left, <laughs> which means probably if you don't have the environment it wants, if it's particular, and this one needs a higher pH, more like seven, maybe you shouldn't try it because it's going to be a nuisance, it's going to be hard to keep alive. 
But for a few years, I had my ebony spleen wart. Okay. All righty. This is, this is my mystery. I have a fern that's very much like this throughout my woods. And the deer don't eat it. But I somehow, it's one of those ferns that are hard to identify. So I finally bought one. It died. I bought, this is the second one. And it has survived. And so I'm hoping this year to compare it to the ones I have growing in the woods and see if I have lady fern out there. Or what is it if it's not lady fern? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is very common. Okay, we can move on. I see the trillium. Huh? Yeah, I see the trillium. Oh. Oops. Oh, there. Probably. Okay. Now, one of the things about lady fern, uh, let me think. Debbie, I need... I said something to you last month. I need to correct it. The corsier, if that's how you pronounce it, is not the rootstock. It's the, as the fern's frond uncurls in the spring, it's the shape of that. <coughs> and on a lady fern, the corsier, if that's how you say it, it sounds French, is an oval shape. I'm assuming most other ferns are round. That's another thing I'm going to check this spring to see. Have you ever seen round I don't know. Well, they pointed out in the book that it was oval, so that meant to me that the others weren't. Another thing on the lady fern, and especially New York fern, which I don't have yet, the fronds at the bottom are smaller, then they get fatter, longer, longer, and then they shrink down again towards the top, so that the frond shape is sort of a, I don't know, a pointy oval. Or whatever that shape would be. Okay, what's next? Japanese. Uh, this, obviously, Japanese is not from the Northeast American woodland. <laughs> However, once upon a time, back when we had Pangaea, all the continents that we now know were <laughs> jigsaw puzzled together, <coughs> sort of lined up across the equator. Then plants that existed back then, 200 million years ago, could go everywhere in their environment. And then when we began to split apart and drift off to what we now are in the world, some plants wound up in China, Japan, Korea, that we now find in the Northwest of America and on our East Coast. So uh, this is also in that little strip behind the north side of the house. And my roommate from college, Inji, who lives down in Washington, DC, this is a morality tale. I gotta take my little side trips like I do. When I visited her about 10 years ago, she lives in Georgetown in a house that's 14 feet wide, which is probably not as wide as this room. And I don't know, maybe 30 feet long. And the yard is only 14 feet wide and goes back behind the house 40 feet, half of which was paved over for parking and the other half was for garden. She hired a landscape designer for $7,000. <laughs> I hate to think of what I would have paid for my thousands of square feet of yard um, to plant a butterfly garden in her 14 feet by maybe 20. Every, except for the woman who was the landscape designer, the five workers that came for a weekend were all basically non-speaking, probably illegals, doing the work. They overplanted by four or five times the plants. Of course, that means more money you pay for, right? So by the second year when I visited, her plants were way too crowded. So the reason I diverted, this beautiful Japanese painted fern was a gift from Inji because she had too many. She couldn't keep them all in her little garden. Mm -hmm. Now, this is planted on the north side of the house in that amended four or five, six inches of sandy. But you see here in the front, it had a little stone, two, two stones high edging. And then I dug out the sod about six inches. So, you know, sod keeps growing into the perimeter gardens. And I um, 
I had a sale because that's easier to weed. Well, after about four years, this very happy Japanese painted fern, it didn't know it was in America. <laughs> it, it really loved its spot and it began to drop spores into the sand edge. And the next year, there were some small Japanese, and I think some of you I've given over the years because it keeps doing it. <laughs> so it's a happy plant. And in a few minutes, I don't know exactly where it is in this new program, we are gonna see a natural hybrid. When we get there, I'll tell you the story. Okay, wow. let's, let's move on. Up, right there. I have a talk about the secret sex life of plants. We're not going into it today, except to say that one night down in the Carolinas, one of those Japanese painted ferns, spores took an amble and made it up, mixed up, had sex with, or whatever the ferns do, with an American paint, uh, American fern, American lady, lady fern, lady fern. And the hybrid that resulted without any human beings messing around was what we now call a ghost fern, which you can buy through the specialty nurseries. Mm -hmm. And it's a pale, basically green, a sort of a gray green with a dark stripe um, for its quote stem. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's bigger, it, it can get 18 inches, maybe two, two feet high and bush out. It's a clump fern again. So it's really, I, lo I love the color. It's like an F1. Uh, next one, F1, F1, right, yeah, right, right, right. F1, but just natural. Yes, naturally done, all on its own, without our help. All right, what's next? Oops. Fast. Ah, cinnamon fern. Now, I'm, I think, let's look at the, the pen and ink drawing. And then, I th okay, so here we have a cinnamon fern, which in a minute I think we'll see it. Let's, let's pop forward and then we can back up again. No, okay, back up. The cinnamon fern, like several in this family, Os Osmundas, I think they are, the first ferns that come up in the spring, May and June, are what we call ferns, green fronds. They're sterile. Then later in the summer, I'm thinking July, in the middle come up the, these stems that have these brown cinnamon colored uh, stalks. That's where the spores are. So something to keep in mind. All right, what's our next picture? Same family, Osmunda, is the interrupted fern. Same thing, early spring growth. And then do we have a picture of, yes. Later in the summer, new fronds will come up and they're interrupted with a stretch of brown. Once again, that's where all the spores are going to be. And then a green topping. So it's kind of interesting. No, no flowers. They, they, they have a totally, and we really didn't go into it because I don't want to. It's too complicated. But ferns first produce, I'm going to call it stage one, which doesn't look like the fern at all. And that's the sexual part. And then they do their thing. And the result of that is the quote fern we see. So it's like a two stage process. Alrighty, what do we got? <clears throat> uh, the ostrich fern. This is kind of a hangover from the Victorian age, over a hundred years ago now. <laughs> and so any house here in Allegheny County that was built in the late 1800s, chances are, Around their front porch, it's going to be this what I call a monster fern. Good four or five feet tall, and it spreads. And once again, here's that brown stalk with all the spores in it. Um, I think ostrich ferns are, are one of the fiddleheads. I think they're one of the main species that produce that delicacy, which I have never tasted. I should do that too this spring. Try cooking up. What do you do, fry them? In butter? Yeah, in butter. In butter? Okay, I gotta try They're that. So early, I've never, I've never had them either. I've always missed them. This you so miss early. them. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do. We'll do a hotline. <laughs> we'll let everybody know when they when they come out. Well, 
once again, I'm a, partic- a fussy gardener. I, I make my plans. That's half the joy. And then I want them to stay put. And a few years after I, I put in, uh, where did I get, did I get this from you? I forget who I got this one from. It began to spread. And I thought, no, 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 we're not doing this. And so I forget where we got it. I got it. Somebody. But anyway, now I cut that brown stalk off so it won't sell so. And then with my spade, every fall, I look to see if there's any runners heading out from the main clump. Because I want it to be a main clump. Period. When I'm dead, (laughs) it will take over that part of the wet woods, but I won't be around to have to see it. All right, what's next? Oh, mine never looks quite like this. Mm, I, I'm thinking this one has more sun or something. It's more spread out. Mine are more always, always stay more upright. And this is obviously early in the spring, maybe May, early June, before the seed, no, spore stalk sets out. Okay. Along the river, they're taller than me. Uh, yeah, I believe they're it. They're as tall as me now. Yep. <laughs> I used to go lost in them. That's the same. Okay, that's the ostrich fern with the, the infertile, sterile frond early on, and then the seed stalk. And once again, small, fatter, longer, shorter. Sensitive. Now, sensitive fern, unlike clumping, goes by um, runners, and it can become quite weedy. This is another fern I have in my woods. It likes wetter ground, and it tolerates sunshine, especially if it's wet feet. So sometimes you'll see along the edge of a woods, a boggy place, a a low place, and instead of grass, this sensitive fern will have taken over. Do I have any pictures of that? Yes. And the individual, um, once again, I had forgotten the vocabulary because I didn't look at that first picture and memorize it. I'm going to say branches, even though it's not branches, are much fatter on sensitive fern. And why is it called that? You touch it and it, it sort of can collapse a bit. Huh. And, it's, and it's the first one in the light frost will turn yellow and die in, in the fall. It's sensitive to frost, more so than others. Okay. Ah, uh, maidenhair fern. Do you have that in Columbia? No. No. Um, this is once again behind the house. I actually, I don't have these in my woods. Um, I've seen them up at um, Stony Brook and they are mm-hmm. around, but I bought this one once again, probably 30 years ago now. Once again, a slow clump former. It has beautiful skinny black, shiny, purplish black, um, I'm going to call them stems. And then like a hand with all the fronds um, coming off. Do we, I think we have a drawing of this that shows it really well. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that neat? So a different form of frond, maidenhair. Um, now, I actually, I don't have a picture of it here, I don't believe, but two years, three years ago, I succumbed to the catalog, one of those <laughs> fancy catalogs that I had here, and bought a maidenhair fern from the Himalayan mountains. Because once again, 200 million years ago, we were all one, pretty much. Um, so now some of our rhododendrons, for instance, also grow well in the Himalayan mountains. So it's a Himalayan maidenhair, and it only grows about eight inches high. And it's gradually getting a little bit bigger. What you got there? I was trying just... Espalina, is it the Latin name for it? No. Mm. Adiantum. Perati. Adiantum. Sounds like a bishop's blessing. <laughs> okay, what's next? We're gonna actually get Alrighty. Now there are several families. We saw like the sensitive fern, the ostrich fern, the interrupted fern, all belong to the same family. Um, the die whatever it is, die blah blah blah. A D Latin word. <laughs> the toothed wood fern belongs to that family, and there are many, many of those ferns out there as well. 
Okay, you can see my ground up leaves that I use as mulch around. Alrighty, what's next? Dead frog. Okay. Um, broke the rule. The bottom are longer and they shrink as they go up the top. By the way, the spores, those little tiny circles, are on the back bottom side of the frond because they drop into water usually or very moist ground or if it's in water then they float away and then that first stage develops and then the second which is the fern that we recognize so spores really need to be dispersed with water okay is that the last one by the way by this chance from this one yeah okay is that my last okay this is an overview yeah. of that north side of the house there's the board and batten to the left. It's facing to the north. I have a, I raised the bed with sand and probably in those days peat moths and topsoil about four inches, I think only. Edged it with those flat stones. Planted my maidenhair, my Japanese painted fern. You can't quite see it on both ends was the Christmas fern. And then these are some wildflowers, um, bunchberry which is a zone two wildflower and they lasted for about 10 12 years and then over two years they died out i'm thinking it's just getting too warm for them in the summertime they oh. do not like those 80 degree temperatures mm. oh. and i love them and it's like Ugh. and then i have some rocks here that particular one is a chunk of lava from outside of flagstaff arizona <laughs> beautiful brown chunk of lava that I think 10,000 years ago, one of those mountains blew its top and here and there across the landscape. So anyway, is that, I think, and what's that? That's my trillium. So anyway, beautiful, beautiful in the shade. Yeah, that was. That All righty. Was Anybody? We did it in about, what, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Oh, Any questions is... before we turn this off? I want to share. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was really on the transplant. I've done the asperage ferns at work, yeah. but that's all I've done. Um, I don't think they're hard at all. You get a good clump, and I would, I always do this. Trim back, and well, maybe leave one so you can remember what it looks like. One, one frond. Trim back the rest of the fronds. Keep it well watered that first year. And put oh, it in the yeah. right spot. Don't stick it yeah. out in the lawn in the sun. <laughs> you know, with the petunias or the marigolds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a uh, fern in Colombia. Okay. Are we still on the air? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I wanted to share this one. Well, this is from Colombia now. Up in the so, mountains or down near the sea? Usually, yeah, in the mountains. In the mountains, okay. Very humid places. And the name is Palma Boba, like kind of like Dom Palm. All right. And yeah, oh, the from name Egypt, the Dom Palm. The name is just uh, this one, Siat, Siatea, Siatea Carcassana. And it's All huge right. and that grows yep. a lot. And it, ta trees. it takes it takes trees. Years. But it's a it's a fern. Yep. Yep. Tree yeah. size. It, it's a fern, but it's huge. It's a tree yeah. size. That's why they call palm. Because right. they grow, like they a grow tree. a lot, but it's a fern, and it starts the same. The fern from the spores and the star, the yep. same. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Now remind me, and I didn't want to say it because I, I didn't look it up. Um, the Carboniferous era. That was for fern trees, right? Yeah. Ferns, yeah. and that's where we get our coal from. Yeah. Right. Okay.